All right, well, we're going to get started. Acts 22. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Someone asked if we'd make up a flyer. It's a flyer. They're out on the table. It's inviting everyone. It says children of all ages uh, for our fifth Sunday. It's got a little pumpkin on it. Tells the worship time, meal time, trick or, or trunk or treat time, whatever it is we have. Trunk or treat. I cannot. Yeah, we have that. Yeah, we have. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's one of those things where you just bring candy. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Oh, so that's in two weeks. Had a good singing um, Friday night. Had uh, 65 people, what I was told. So it's a good number. Thankful for everybody and everything that was done. Acts 22. <laughs> Paul gave a defense. And Paul's defense of, of himself was really his story, as we said. And he told of his conversion. It was... It, not the first time we've seen it in the book of Acts. It's not going to be the last time that we see it in the book of Acts. But it is uh, Paul's rendition or Paul's version, Paul telling the story this time in Acts 22, as he's giving a defense for himself. And he does real well with it, if you will, till he gets to the very end. Uh, really, there's nothing that's confrontational. There's nothing that's upsetting about it. But he gets to the end. He gets to verse 17. He, gives, he tells the people the commission that God had given to him. And then right at the end of it, in verse 21, he said, uh, he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And that one word, really, if you stop and think about it, that one word was a major agitation to the folks. All of a sudden, they realize now Paul is going to carry a gospel that they needed to accept. But he's going to take it to everybody because when he that's when he said the word Gentiles, that's really what he's saying. Now, you could say, well, wait a minute. Galatians chapter two, Paul talked about meeting with Peter and basically deciding that that uh, Peter would pretty much stay with with the folks that were were of Jewish background. And Paul would go everywhere else. Paul would go to the Gentiles. And that's true. We're not arguing that fact. But understand that when you're speaking to Jewish folks in Paul's day, now we're talking about in Paul's day, you're speaking to Jewish folks in Paul's day, they don't want to hear that the gospel that it has been only for them all of a sudden is going to be open for everybody. They don't want to hear that. They are God's children. They are God's select. And, and first of all, the gospel, according to their mind, their way of thinking, doesn't change. Yet at the same point in time, too, it's just for us. And there were there was a certain, if you will, animosity in biblical times for folks that uh, you were a Jew or you were a Gentile and whatever you were, if you will, then you were at odds with the other. That's sad, sad to say the least. It doesn't add much to, to uh, world peace, if you will. But nevertheless, it is what was going on at that time with Paul having said this then, and we're ready to start here in verse 22 of Acts 22. They listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Now think about this. They didn't just say, let's throw him in prison. Let's just put him out of town. Let's kill him. That was their idea. That was their thought. Let's, let's, take his, let's take his life. He's not fit to live. He's not worthy to live. Then, as they cried out, tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air. Really, the tearing of clothes is kind of opposite, antithetical to, to the throwing of dust in the air. You tore your clothes when you were sad. This was probably more out of anger than sadness, but the idea of throwing dust in the air was a sign of contempt. We don't like what's said. We don't like him. And so they would throw the dust in the air. Now, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined. The word examined there, uh, keep reading, under scourging. 
examine it. In other words, we're going to beat the answer out of you that we, we, you know, this is the answer we want. We're going to beat it out of you. And so they might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs or leather straps, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is Roman and uncondemned? A Roman who did who didn't do a crime. Can you can you Paul says can you scourge a man like that? According to Roman law, you couldn't. According to Roman law, you couldn't. First of all, you didn't beat a Roman, but you didn't beat him. That especially if you didn't have some just cause for doing that. And so Paul's statement in many ways is an appeal but is also maybe a statement that was, for whatever reason, unseen to the folks at that time, and that was Roman citizenship. Now, one of the things that happened in first century that's kind of interesting was is that there were folks that weren't Roman citizens, but had forged documents that they carried around with them, and they flipped them out when they needed them as a sort of a, a get-out-of-jail-quick card. And so they would have to, of course, uh, look into this, look into, to, is this so, is this right? And, and, and yet it's also, when you think about it, it's also kind of interesting. You wonder why Paul waited till this time to reveal his Roman citizenship. Paul been out preaching and teaching. Uh, this is somewhere around 50, well, 57 AD, somewhere. Paul has been uh, preaching the gospel since 42, 47, 42, 45, somewhere in that neighborhood uh, AD. So Paul, Paul's been out preaching for 10 plus years, more like 15. Maybe others knew. But those to whom he's talking, they did not know, evidently. But nevertheless, Paul pulls this out. And when the centurion, he's just a, he, he's over, of course, he, he's over 100 men, but he's just a, a, another cog, if you will, another wheel in the army. He's not a, a, what we would think of as the commander in chief. The centurion heard that. He went and he told the commander, saying, take care or be careful what you do, for this man is a Roman. The commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? Paul said, yes. The commander answered him, with, this, with a large sum of money, I obtained this citizenship. In other words, I bought it. I bought it. Now, the title in the state of Kentucky, the title of colonel means nothing anymore. But you know that you can become a colonel. The, when the state legislature meets, uh, if you have someone that will put it on the floor and it's documented and then they send you a, a, a pretty little piece of paper that says you're a colonel in the state of Kentucky. It really means nothing. It's just sort of a honorary tag. I am not a colonel. I was there for two years, but I was one of those that was glad to get out of Kentucky. Nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, you can do that. Well, while not the same, it is the same. You see, here you have this commander saying, I bought my citizenship. I wasn't a Roman citizen. I bought it. And Paul says, whoop, not me. I was born in Rome. And so this creates a problem for the Romans. The Romans were brutal. I guess would probably be the, the best word I could come up with towards those that were not Romans. But they were very civil, sympathetic towards fellow Romans. And so their problem is, what do we do with this Roman? Verse 29, immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Now, the fear comes not only out of the way they're treating him, but the reprisal that will come from Rome itself. In other words, what once Rome finds out 
how we're treating folks that are Roman citizens back here. Rome's going to be upset with us, and if Rome is upset with us, they will do things to us. They will will take away certain liberties that we have. They will become very oppressive towards us. They will commander, remove me from being a commander. And so they're afraid. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priest and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. And then we're going to have Paul answer Paul before the Sanhedrin in the next chapter. But that sets the tone for what's coming next. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Okay. Well, we go into chapter 23. We have Paul's defense again. A little different situation, but nevertheless, Paul's still defending himself. It says, Paul looked earnestly at the council, riveted. The idea of looked earnestly, as the New King James translates, means the idea of a riveted gaze. He really looked, was looking at these people at the council. And here's his answer. Men and brethren, he begins like he began in chapter 22, and like he's begun other defenses, and that is that he tries to sort of, if you will, kind of smooth over some things, make it a little easier, make it a little more uh, appealing. And so he's trying to be courteous. He's disarming these folks by being courteous, men and brethren. Now, you could say, well, is he talking about brethren from a nationalistic standpoint? Is he talking about brethren from the standpoint of the Lord's church? It seems to be it would be more nationalistic here. These, this is the Sanhedrin after all. And so Paul says, I have lived in all good conscience. Now, understand the tense. We, I've often said we've got to understand the tense that is used. Paul uses the tense, just simply means I lived, past tense. Lived, past tense. Not living, but lived. In the past, when I was living in the past, persecuting Christians, as he's going to say, I did this in good conscience. What does the text say? He says, I've, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. All the sin in his life. He said, I, I, I lived in good conscience. Persecuting Christians, I lived in good conscience. Excuse me, we, we've heard lessons and sermons. People talk about conscience and it's important. You know, I think we, we've probably gone to extremes with regards to the subject of conscience. Conscience is a good thing. It's given to us by God. It uh, helps us navigate through life. It just can't be the final answer. That's, that's the, the point. It can't be the final answer. The reason is because the conscience is taught. We teach the conscience. You might say, well, I didn't teach it anything. Yeah, you did. Your mom, and, your mom and daddy taught it the way you, the, the way you were brought up, what you were around, the things that you began to accept, those things taught your conscience. And so conscience is, is a taught part within us. We taught ourselves this is right and this is wrong. I do things every once in a while, and I think, you know, I do that for a conscience standpoint, but why? Because it's really, maybe it's a, a matter of tradition. And I think, ah, yeah, mom and dad. <laughs> mom and dad. Influence of mom and dad. Paul, well, being a Jew, his conscience said, it's all right to kill Christians. It's all right to, to, to go out and do what I did towards Christianity because my faith said that it was all right. That didn't mean that it was all right. But Paul said, I lived in all good conscience. Every step I take, and I've said this before, it intrigues me that through the years, but it seems like it, it maybe is not as great as what it used to be because of a lack of spiritual influences of today. But 
you still hear it amongst certain people. Oh, those Church of Christ people, they think they're right. I, you know, when you're, you're, as you get older, you get a little more crotchety. You understand that. I've begun to answer that this way. Yeah. But can I ask you a question? Sure. Don't you think you're right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So now we have to figure out who is right. Nobody does anything that they don't figure that they're right. They all... We all think we're right in what we're doing and what we're saying, or we wouldn't be doing it. Paul says, I thought I was all right. He said, I lived in good conscience before God until this day, and the high priest, Ananias. Now, Ananias was not the, he was, you say, oh, he was a high priest. Yeah, but he was corrupt. His his years of service, especially as a high priest, were, were A.D. 47 to A.D. 59. So if we're at A.D. 57, we're right at the end. But but Paul, or excuse me, Ananias, was charged and actually had to go back to Rome for a period of time for his oppression of the Samaritans. He, he didn't treat them well. And so he was called into Rome. He was acquitted. Probably shouldn't have been. But uh, nevertheless, he was acquitted, and he was carried there because, like I say, he was ruthless. But Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him, Paul, on the mouth. Paul said to Ananias, or said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Whitewashed. You know, do you have a sense of what what is what what's Paul saying about it? Now covering up part of it. Hypocrite. Yeah. Matthew twenty three, where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, he calls them uh, you're you know, like a whitewashed sepulchre, you're covering it up, you're a hypocrite. You're playing one role, but in reality you're another. So so Paul Paul is not Mixing words here with Ananias. For you sit to judge me according to the law. And do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Now, you say, well, where does this fit in? Go back to Deuteronomy. Go back to Deuteronomy 25. Let's just go back and read that. Deuteronomy 25. If there's a dispute between, this is beginning in verse 1. If there's a dispute between two men and they come to court, that the judges may judge them and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, then it shall be, if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, that the judge will cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence according to his guilt with a certain number of blows. And he goes on to discuss that. So in other words, here's the here's the key. The key is is that you have to go before the judge. There has to be a decision made. There has to be a judgment rendered. And Paul says, you know, how are you doing this? He says, why are you doing this? You sit in judgment of me before you've ever heard the facts. He couldn't be struck until the judgment occurred. It's interesting. Just think about if you're sitting there as Ananias and you're sitting there and you're listening and you're thinking, okay, he's he said he's Roman. He knows Jewish law. What is he? Where is he? You see, there's a there's probably as the judge is sitting there, there's probably a, a mixture of thought going through his head. What is he? Where you know, where does he stand? How am I to judge him? Am I to judge him? 
And so those who stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? Do you speak abusively to, to the Lord's high priest? Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you should not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, the word know there, he says, I did not know. We've talked about a little bit about this before. There are a couple of, of different Greek words that are used in throughout the New Testament that are translated no. There's the, the word gnosko, which, like I say, is translated no. And then there's the word oida, which is the word that's used here. The word that's used here has knowledge or have regard for. He said, I didn't have knowledge of that. Well, what did you not have knowledge of? I didn't have knowledge that he was the high priest. And then he said, he quotes the Old Testament. He quotes, if you, if you want to go back and read, we'll not read this one because it's a quote out of it, but it's Exodus chapter 22, verse 28. You don't speak evil of your, your ruler. But Paul did not know who he was insulting. You might say, well, how did he not know? I don't know. I don't know. The text really doesn't uh, allow me to, to answer that question. It could be that Ananias was such a different type high priest and maybe he didn't act like one and maybe just with the fact that he was already ordering folks to strike him that Paul felt like, well, you know, he, he's not following the law. He's not a high priest. I, I don't really know the answer to that. But nevertheless, this is the conversation. And when Paul, verse 6, perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I'm not a, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I'm being judged. Guess who he just offended? Half the group. <laughs> he offended the Sadducees. It gets us back to something we talked about here a couple of weeks ago. Our society today wants to stay neutral. You know, we've got to have the right pronouns for folks, and it's got to be neutral. Everything has to be neutral. And the reality of it is, is there's no neutrality. Because I can use something one way, one time, and it be incorrect for another group. And if it's not incorrect now, in a matter of just a little bit of time, it will be incorrect for somebody. You can think of all kinds of examples. You can think of all kinds of things that, you know, that we'll just take one. It's, it's very simple. You don't use the term gay anymore. You might say, oh, wait a minute. They use, you know, LBGQ to understand that. But they don't want you to use it for them. Okay. I want to respect them. I, I want to treat them nicely, kindly, lovingly. Uh, I want to teach them the truth, but I still want to I still want to treat them the way I believe Jesus would teach would would treat them. So we don't use that term anymore because it's offensive. Well, if you think about that term, it's changed, right? Go back and read early literature. When you found the word gay, what did it mean? Happy. Happy. It turned at some point, and it turned to the point of where it was talking about those that uh, are what we would call now homosexuals. So at one point it turned. When it turned, I'm sure there were still some people that used it to mean happy and probably found themselves on the wrong side of the fence because people became upset at their use of it. 
That's to say that language changes. It will always change. It is it is constantly evolving. But to say that we're going to use pronouns with regards to transgender uh, folks, that we're going to to use pronouns for the transvestites, we're going to we're going to use terms that are neutral is impossible. Because I guarantee you, I could use some terms right now and you wouldn't be offended. But if I carried them to certain other groups, it would offend them. And so we we learn from this story in the book of Acts that even Paul offended people. Now, I don't think Paul was trying to be offensive. I think Paul is just stating, this is what I believe. But it did, as Jim said, it offended half the group. The Sadducees. Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in spiritual bodies. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They were they were rich. They were arrogant individuals. They were folks that, well, they didn't follow teachings of scriptures, you might say. Pharisees, on the other hand, they believed in the resurrection. They believed in life after this life. But Paul when he makes this statement, he automatically offends some. And so, as he says this, he says it with regards to himself. He says, I'm a Pharisee. I'm the son of a Pharisee. Considering hope, I believe in the resurrection from the dead. But he says, this is the reason that you're judging me. This is the reason for being judged as Paul saw it. And so, verse 7, when he had said this, a dissension, strong dissension, arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, some might wonder, is this the reason Paul brought it up? You see, he has automatically, he has split the Sanhedrin. He has automatically split the group that's sitting in judgment of him. He's automatically gotten them to all of a sudden get into their corners, as we would say. Pharisees over here, Sadducees over here. It's almost like I don't get involved in politics in the church, but it's almost like Democrats and Republicans, you know, in our day and age. And so you might say, well, Paul did that to split them, and he may have, but he's stating the truth. This is what he believed. This is how he was raised. This is where he came from. For the Sadducees say there's no resurrection, no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, probably from a mob, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us fight. Let us not fight against God. See, the Pharisees, ah, it's Pharisee. We'll take him on. Now, when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled by a piece or pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. So you see, they're at odds of what to do with him. And and right now, at least from the text, and maybe I'm reading a little bit too much into this, so be careful with what I'm about to say. But it seems as if they went from being united against Paul to being divided in their own camps and thus fighting amongst themselves, Pharisees and Sadducees, that is. Anything else? Yeah, that's true. I don't know. Right. From from a textual standpoint, don't know. It's kind of hard to believe that he didn't from a logical standpoint, but from a textual standpoint, you're right don't have one so yeah
Well, from a standpoint of, of having a teacher, that was not a problem. A lot of Jews had teachers. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of yeah. Jews. Yeah. Yeah, no, a lot of. Yes. That's the only thing I can figure, but I still, some, somebody had to know. <laughs> but it, the, the text doesn't say, so. Yeah. No, he, it, if, if he had claimed it publicly, like you say, from a religious standpoint, he would have been an outcast, very much so, even though he was a Pharisee a Jew, he would still have been considered an outcast. He would have been a really, in many ways he already was, but he would have been a man without a country. Anything else? All good. Oh, good. Yeah, Paul's going to talk about Gamaliel and uh, his his teacher. But there's a plot now that, as as the plot thickens, if you will, there's a plot that, that comes about. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you've testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Now, Paul had already established the fact that he wanted to go to Rome. That had been something that those around him, excuse me, knew that that was a desire of his to go to Rome. He, he talked about it in, in the book of Romans. Uh, he also talked about it here in the 20th chapter. He had a desire. That's what he went on to do. And uh, this is this is one of those things that I use, have used uh, a time or two here already and, and use uh, in talking about the providence of God. We never know how the providence of God works out and it works through things. But Paul wanted to go to Rome. Paul got to go to Rome, but not the way Paul would have, you know, if Paul if Paul had had his way, Paul would have gotten on a ship, gone to Rome, and had a, a nice vacation, work vacation probably. But that's not the way he went. He went as a prisoner as we, because we already know the story. But uh, nevertheless, Paul was told by the Lord. And the faith that he has in the Lord will show itself a little later on. Remember when the the ship is in the midst of a storm. But Paul was told by the Lord, you're going to get to Rome and you're going to bear witness to me of Rome. And notice, if you will, that the way it's stated here in this text, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness from Rome. He knew he had to go, and he knew he would get there. But not only did he have that assurity, but he had that assurity because of what? His earlier testimony. And so, verse, I keep saying the word so today. Y'all just ignore it. Sorry, it's stuck in my head. Verse 12, when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Boy, this is this is a plot, to say the least. How people can, can do this, I, I don't know. How people can, can hate others to that end, I, I don't understand it. I, I don't, won't, ever, haven't, probably won't ever understand that it's sort of the same thing of what's going on in israel today i i understand it from a rational standpoint but from also from a, a spiritual and emotional standpoint how can you hate other individuals so much i don't know but notice what he says he says uh, or the text says verse 13 now, there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priest and elders and said, we've bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we've killed Paul. Now, you, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we're ready to kill him before he comes near. They're ready to ambush him. They're going to kill him. They're going to murder him. 
But we, we look at this and we wonder, you know, what is it about these folks? Why did, why did these folks hate Paul and ultimately then hate the truth? That's, that's the question to be asked. And that's the question to be asked today to our society. I was looking at some, some facts and some figures um, this week just to get a, gr- a grasp of something for myself and for some further uh, study a little later on. And in the 20 to 30 age group, before the pandemic, there was about 28% of that group that went to church. Now, I'm using to church, very broad. Since the pandemic, about 20% of 20-year-olds go to church. And it was, for 30-year-olds, it was about 25% before the pandemic, and it's about 20% now after the pandemic. And like I say, I'm using church, not Church of Christ. I'm using church from a very broad standpoint. But this was done by Pew Research. When you you think about that, you think about 80% of folks in that age group are not going to church. Now, here's what was surprising to me. Folks 65 and above, before the pandemic, had about 49% that went to church. So you see, like I say, we're and about 49% after the pandemic going to church. You still, you look at that and you say, well, that was the group with the highest percentage going to church. So as I tell you, less than 50% of folks in the United States go to church anywhere. Something to to stop and think about. Well, these folks uh, hated the truth, hated listening to the truth, for whatever reason. And so they wanted to kill Paul. Paul had made the Sadducees mad. Paul had made the Jews mad. And Rome really didn't know what to do with him. So these folks had made this little pact. They're going to ambush Paul. They're going to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, what does that tell you? Paul had a what? Nephew. There you go. See, I can't work that stuff out. I have to look at Suzanne. So what? But I, I spent time figuring that one out. Paul's oh, sister's son. I had to stop and think, oh, okay, my sister's son. Okay. Nephew. Nephew. When Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. This is a little sentence here. In the providence of God, that when you see that picture, you don't often use. But here's the, here's part of that picture. Paul's nephew comes in and tells him, I've heard of something. I've heard of a plot to kill you. Paul called then to one of the centurions to him and said, take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. The word young man is interesting. You might say, well, no, not really. It is for that day and age. That gives us an idea that Paul's nephew was somewhere probably between the age of 20, 24 to about 48. So in his 20, you know, it could be anywhere late 20s to early 30s or mid 30s, probably somewhere in that neighborhood. But anyway, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him and he brought him to the commander and said, Paul, the speaker or Paul, the prisoner, excuse me, I don't know where I came up that. Paul, the prisoner called to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside, and asked privately, what is it that you have to tell me? I want you to, to catch something. When he, he asked him, the, the tense here of the verb is, is it's imperfect. Th- there were some extensive questions. It wasn't just one question. What do you have to tell me? Seemingly, there were a lot of of maybe questions you might say from an interrogation standpoint not not formal interrogation but you know he asked several questions okay you're giving me this information okay what about this and what about that what do you know what do you and so he asked him several questions privately and he says what do you have to tell me and it's kind of interesting that he took this man in he took paul's nephew in and and was willing to talk to him but anyway he said 
the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they've killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you've revealed these things to me. Keep this in secret. Anything else? Paul seeks to go to Felix, but anything else? Okay. So he called for two centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. This would have been about a 60-mile trip. The average day trip was 20 miles, so you're talking about three days, really. But they, they're going to protect Paul. Notice that it says that uh, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night, about 9 o'clock. Night trip, didn't do that either. <laughs> But they were going to do what they could to protect Paul, send him to the governor, an area, if you will, an area leader, political leader, Governor Felix. And he wrote in a letter, Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent Felix. Felix was, I say, he was, if you read much, if you read much in history, you might find the word procurator, which is what's translated here, governor. It's it is what he was. He was he. The Romans would call him a procurator. He was a procurator from about 52 A.D. to to 60. He was a procurator or governor of Judea. And so they're sending this to him, this letter to him. And notice what he says: Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews. And was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him. You see, this story has what? How much truth in it? <laughs> Hardly any. He says, uh, the Jews were about to kill him, and I rescued him. Having learned that he was a Roman. Well, he did learn that. When I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was accused concerning the question of their law but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. His note, like I say, doesn't include all the truth. It kind of, it kind of leaves out, well, it doesn't kind of, it does. It leaves out the incriminating parts. He doesn't want to get himself into trouble. But he writes this letter saying, okay, here's what I know. Here's what I found out. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. You take care of it. The soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul, brought him by night to Antipas. Now, Antipas would have been somewhere, should have been somewhere around 35 miles from Jerusalem. The next day, they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the barracks. And when they came to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. And when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. The, the praetorium was an area that was built around 23 B.C., about 165 acres, a very splendid white stone building, if you will, built by Herod the Great. But this was keeping of Paul. It's interesting from this, this paragraph is interesting from the standpoint. When Paul gets there, the governor, after he reads the letter, he, okay, Paul, where are you from? Okay, you're from Cilicia. All right, I'll hear you on this matter. But at this point, he wants to keep all things secret. 
the idea of keeping secrets, the idea of waiting. Probably waited about five days, as a matter of fact. But let's wait and let's see. Let's cast judgment upon this here a little bit later. It reminds us, though, of the importance also of confidentiality. Somebody tells you something and they ask you to keep it quiet. That's your responsibility. That's what you're to do. I've seen known of people that that could not keep a confidence. And that's bad. I had a lady come to me once and had a family problem. And she came to me and she said, now I've told somebody else. And she told me who she had told. And she said, but I asked them and I ask you the same thing. Please don't tell anyone. And I said, not a problem. Not a problem. And so it wasn't very long. Just a couple of weeks later, I was at a church fellowship meal. And the individual that she had told and had gone to to talk to about this family problem was sitting in the midst of church people, called this lady's name and told everybody sitting there at that table about her problems. I overheard it. I was not I was on a row the next row over, but I overheard that. And I thought, you can't tell that individual anything and ask them to keep it private because they won't. And it turned out they didn't, a lot of things. But needless to say, we need to learn that lesson from this. Anything else or any other lessons you might want to learn? Well, that's a good place to stop because next Sunday, Suzanne and I will not be here. We will be on vacation. We will be returning from vacation. Well, actually, we we will have been back in town, but I was informed just five minutes ago we may be somewhere else. <laughs> we won't be here, but we will be back, and I will start work then, back to work a week from tomorrow. So, so we're going to take this next week off and uh, enjoy some time together and play and relax. And I know you'll have teachers and preachers next week. Finally, finally. We've got a temporary coming temporarily for one Sunday. And uh, uh, it looks like he's going to be in the area. We've secured him to, to come and preach. And I told Jay that that's a good preacher for in that one few years. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have one that Sunday. So that's February. Uh, I think I think Jay and Jim are splitting the responsibilities. And so that means you'll have good next Sunday as well. Anything else? Well, no, we love you. No, we're thinking about you. And, and uh, if we can do anything for you at any time, we'd be glad to do it. But isn't it wonderful that the Lord loves us and takes care of us? How's Miss Kaysen? Do you mind giving us a little report? How's she, how did she make it yesterday? Good. Yeah. That's good. Anybody else? I don't know of anybody. That doesn't mean that there's not. I just don't know of anybody. Let's bow forward to prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day, thankful for the blessings that you've given to us. Thankful for the opportunity that we have to come together and study your word. And as we look at this story of Paul and the, the really the, the fast moving aspects as we read it of, of the end of his life, we know that it's not the end. For we know that he lives long past the book of Acts. But we see your providence of getting him to, to Rome and getting him to, to proclaim your message in Rome. And we see your hand. And we realize that your hand, just as is, is was in his life, is in our life as well. We ask that you be with us, that you bless us, that we may always live with you and for you. Be with Kaysen and be with the others that, that are sick and, and ill and going through tough times. Watch over them, bless them, and keep them. We ask that you watch over us and bless us and hold us as we hold to you. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. And you might want to check on Buck and Miss Minnie this week. I don't know where they are today. So y'all have a great week.